Gonzaga and USC are in talks to play in Las Vegas in December. Is Bronny James good enough to take down the Bulldogs, or will Dusty Stromer continue his four-game winning streak against LeBron's son? You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Happy Friday to those of you checking out the show on Friday. Uh, It's all about the schedule today. We are talking all things Gonzaga schedule. First, we will discuss the reported matchup against USC December 2nd in Las Vegas. We'll talk about that. We're also going to take a look at the rest of of the non-conference schedule that we already know. The defending champs are on the schedule. Kentucky's on the schedule. Who else is there? And then we're going to close out the show discussing what teams are not there, what teams that could be added. The Zags still have a lot of room to add to their schedule. All that wrapping us up this week before next week when we get into some solid draft content on Julian Strother and Drew Timmy before the big day on Thursday, June 22nd. But today we got news. We got news to talk about today on the podcast. The Zags are reportedly in talks to play USC, and it sounds like they're working on finalizing the game. And when you hear that teams are in talks to play each other and they give you a date and a location, that tends to mean that they are farther along than just those preliminary conversations. Right now, it sounds like one of the major things they're still working on is where the game is going to be played. But what we were seeing, and I saw this from Stadium's Jeff Goodman on Twitter, he says, December 2nd is the date being discussed between Gonzaga and USC. The game will be in Las Vegas, and they're discussing two different locations, either the MGM Grand or the Mandalay Bay. Both have arenas on their on the facility Uh, i know for mandalay bay it's the michelob ultra arena it's a twelve thousand seat arena kind of right off the side behind the mandalay bay the mgm Uh, i I don't know exactly how many it holds but a similar amount i'm guessing t-mobile arena is unavailable or they're expecting it to be unavailable or they just don't think that this is going to headline that uh certainly glad we're not going to see this game in the orleans that is good news no disrespect to the orleans but this game needs to be on a bigger stage than that so hopefully the The arena situation is the only thing they're finalizing. There's probably some other logistical things they're still working on in terms of maybe some NIL deal for the students or uh, whatnot. But uh, this looks like a game that is going to happen, and I think it's going to happen on December 2nd. Uh, I just It's not quite finalized yet for those of you who are currently pulling up flights. Just want to make sure you know that we're still still not we're still waiting for that final confirmation. But I guarantee you that I'm going to do everything I can to be at that game because, man, that is a really, really fun matchup. The Zags are 1-2 and two all time against USC. The win, though, Really fun one for those of you who don't remember the 2021 NCAA tournament, the year that Gonzaga went all the way to the national championship game before losing to Baylor. Uh, They beat USC in the Elite Eight. Drew Timmy had 23 points against uh, NBA Defensive Player of the Year candidate Evan Mobley, one of the best defenders in all of college basketball that year. Timmy had 23. Mobley had 19. More importantly, the Zags won by 19 advancing to play UCLA. And of course, that very, very epic matchup with Jalen Suggs as game winner. The two losses for Gonzaga against USC came in 1992 and 1993, uh, back when USC was a good basketball program with Harold Miner and when Gonzaga was the kind of team that programs like USC scheduled as gimme games. That's how long it's been since Gonzaga and UCLA have, or excuse me, USC have really played each other uh, outside of that NCAA tournament game. Uh, But the big story here is, of course, USC's recent edition of Bronny James, the son of NBA superstar LeBron James. Bronny uh, was picking between USC and Oregon and Ohio State, and I think there was a couple other programs tangentially involved in his recruitment, but USC always felt like kind of a, a front runner because, of course, located in Southern California, where LeBron currently is, have some deep pockets, have a lot of pedigree, uh, not a, 
a, a great basketball program historically, but they have been good lately. Coach Andy Enfield has done a nice job of getting that team routinely into the NCAA tournament, which uh, doesn't necessarily sound like a huge accomplishment, but that was not historically the case at USC. And, and so to see them continue to do that in a Pac-12 that hasn't been all that good. They've been one of the better teams. Of course, they will not be in the Pac-12 for very much longer after this season. They will be jumping over to the Big Ten. It'll be fascinating to see if uh, Enfield's strategy will kind of how it will work in the Big Ten conference against a, a different caliber of opponent. Typically in the Big Ten, they just play a different style of basketball there. It's going to be interesting to see, but Bronny and Dusty Strom are very familiar with each other right now. Dusty Stromer looks potentially like he will be a rotation piece for Gonzaga next year, depending on if they make another addition or not. We talked about that on Monday. You everyday listeners know we've been talking about the lineup and the rotation quite a bit the last week or so. Dusty has a potential to be in that rotation. And Dusty and Bronny took each other on a handful of times. Uh, Dusty at Notre Dame and Bronny at Sierra Canyon High School in California. And uh, Dusty went 4-0. and One of those games Bronny did not play. But otherwise, Dusty... He took care of business. He took care of that team. And so it'll be kind of fun. I don't envision that Dusty's going to be a, a huge contributor for Gonzaga next year. I'm also not entirely sure what Bronny's role is going to be. Uh, that's kind of a, another question mark here uh, for, for USC. I think Bronny's probably going to come off the bench, which will be interesting to see how that is received. Uh, USC is returning Boogie Ellis who was one of the best players in the Pac-12 last year. Boogie averaged 18 points per game, and he is a combo guard. He's more of a, a two guard than a point guard necessarily, but they already have the point guard position pretty well taken care of as well with Isaiah Collier, the number one ranked prospect in the class of 2023, is coming to USC to join the Trojans. So they have the number one ranked point guard in the class. They have an 18 point per game scorer. Those two guys are probably going to start, and neither of them are very big. So starting a three-guard lineup with Bronny, as well as Collier, as well as Boogie Ellis, is just really small. And I have a hard time imagining that they're going to do that. They also return a starter from last year's team, Kobe Johnson, who's six foot five, small forward, who averaged nine and five last year. So I think he starts at the three, Boogie starts at the two, Collier starts at the one. That means your boy Bronny is coming off the bench. That is my expectation for this team at this point. Anyway, uh, they're going to be a really talented guard rotation in the front court. We'll see how that looks. They lose Drew Peterson to graduation. Drew Peterson was one of the best players in the Pac-12 last year as well. Kind of a stretch four hybrid type. He's out the door. Trey White transfers to Louisville. He's out the door. Reese Dixon Waters, the sixth man of the year in the Pac-12 last year. He transfers to San Diego State. But they do add DJ Rodman, the son of Dennis Rodman. We spoke about him on a previous podcast as a potential target for Gonzaga as well. He is heading to USC to join the uh, group of former NBA Hall of Famer sons in Rodman and, of course, James on that team. This USC team was 22-11 and 11 last year. They earned a 10 seed in the NCAA tournament before losing to Michigan State in the first round, a somewhat underseeded or at least underappreciated Michigan State team that is looking like they might be in the top five this upcoming season. So... USC is good. They're a good, solid basketball program. They're going to be very good next year with Collier and Bronny joining the mix uh, with Boogie Ellis and uh, Rodman and everybody else coming back to that program. Gonzaga is expected to be better, uh, ranked higher at least by the time that game rolls around in early December. But this should be a really, really fun matchup. Will LeBron be in the house? I have no idea. I looked up the uh, NBA schedules for the 23-24 season. They are not out yet. Uh, LeBron also is... It's not 100% that he's going to be on the Lakers next season. I think he probably will be. There's some rumors floating around that, that perhaps things will change for him next year. But if he's on the Lakers and the Lakers are off that day, I think there's an incredibly good chance that LeBron finds his way to Las Vegas to watch this game, which would be an extremely cool experience uh, just for Gonzaga to be in a game that, that merits that kind of attention from, from everybody uh, around the college basketball landscape. Well, USC is the latest in an already excellent non-conference schedule for Mark Few's team, including the defending champion UConn Huskies. More coming up on that game and the rest of the schedule as we know it so far after a word from today's sponsor, Bird Dogs. I don't know how else to say this, so I'm just going to keep it simple. Bird Dogs short and pants, they make you look good. The Bird Dogs stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thighs and legs, giving you a more sculpted look. In fact, Bird Dogs do the same exact thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They also fit better than regular shorts made of stiff, restricting cotton. How? Bird Dogs fixed it by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so that you get a slimmer fit without sacrificing movement. It also uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that helps keep you cool and dry all day long. 
So go to birddogs.com slash locked on college and enter the promo code locked on college for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free Yeti style tumbler. You will not want to take your bird dogs off. I promise you bird dogs, a proud sponsor of the locked on podcast network. Folks want to let you know about Locked On's NBA Mock Draft Special. It is here, and it is bigger than ever before. Follow along the entire first round in a six-episode Ultimate Mock Draft experience. Only Locked On can deliver. We got every NBA host making a pick for who they want to take in the first round. We have analysis from myself and everybody else in the Locked On College channel talking about these specific players and what they bring into the NBA for next season. It is fantastic. It is available on Locked On College Basketball's YouTube channel, as well as the Locked On NBA Big Board. And again, it is also available wherever you get your podcasts. Well, today is scheduled day here on Locked On Zag, so we're going to continue to talk about Gonzaga's schedule for next season. We know that USC is in talks to be added to Gonzaga's schedule for December 2nd. Assuming that game does end up happening, that is in a long line of already solid games for Gonzaga in the 2023-24 season. There's still plenty of room to add more games, and we will close out the show discussing that. But for now, I want to look at the games that Gonzaga has already added and what we have to look forward to next season so far on that schedule. First up, the big one, the defending champions, Danny Hurley's UConn Huskies, a team that, of course, did some serious damage to Gonzaga last year, held him to 54 points in an Elite Eight loss that, of course, catapulted UConn to the Final Four and, of course, all the way all to their NCAA championship. They're fifth in the last 25 years, a really tremendous program being built at UConn or having already been built at UConn, I should say. This game does not have a date yet, but it is going to be played at Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle. Uh, again, they, they're not really calling these the battle in Seattle, but Gonzaga has been scheduling these neutral site, neutral site, uh, kind of home v. home, except neutral site games. And uh, the Alabama one is the most notable one. They played Alabama in Seattle. They played the return game against Alabama in Birmingham. And I've mentioned before, I don't like home and homes where one team actually plays at home and one team does not. Uh, and for this matchup, that was not, or for the Alabama matchup, that was not the case. And it is also not the case for this UConn matchup as they will play in Seattle. And then the return game will be at Madison Square Garden during the 24-25 season. What an extraordinary uh, series that is going to be between these two teams. UConn is 4-2 and two all time against Gonzaga. Every single game has been played at a neutral site. Uh, most of them have been in the NCAA tournament. They have yet to play each other at either of the play uh, either team's actual home arena will not be the case here for UConn they lose Adama Sonogo they lose Andre Jackson Jr they lose Jordan Hawkins three key starters from last year's team they also lose some bench depth and Nahima Lean who transferred to St. John's and Joey Calcaterra the former San Diego guard who is out of eligibility but they gain Cam Spencer out of Rutgers a really nice sharp shooting transfer portal edition for them. They also have one of the top 10 prospects in the 2023 class joining them in Stefan Castle. And they retain Donovan Klingon, who looked like he had the potential to be a, a all big East player this season, potentially even an all American caliber player as a sophomore starting center for them. They return Alex Caravan and Tristan Newton as well. So this team is still going to be very, very solid when Gonzaga faces them probably in November, December sometime at climate pledge arena. And then you have Kentucky and again, this is where I, I, I've we've litigated this conversation a million times on Locked On Zags. I'm not going to get into it too far, but they played at home, according to the metrics, home for Gonzaga at the Spokane Arena. They're returning the home game at Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky, you know, where Kentucky actually plays all of their home games, whereas Gonzaga does not play all of their home games at the Spokane Arena. Regardless, Gonzaga is going to go to Rupp Arena. They're going to play a Kentucky team that as of right now, doesn't have a lot of depth. They don't have a lot of anything. If we're being perfectly honest, they have five, six now incoming freshmen in the class of 2023, the number one ranked recruiting class, mind you, in a relatively weak 2023 class. They have six freshmen, two lightly used sophomores who didn't play much last year, and that's it. Antonio Reeves is uh, not yet in the transfer portal, but he is reportedly getting his graduate degree or working on getting his undergrad degree from Illinois State. And if he gets that done, he will then likely enter the transfer portal and expand his options as a graduate student. So if they don't return Reeves, they have almost no experience returning to the roster. They have made no additions in the transfer portal. We're connected to Grant Nelson, connected to Arthur Kaluma, connected to a handful of other players who have thus far not chosen to go to Kentucky. Perhaps they'll land somebody like Paul Mulcahy, but 
this might not be a very great Kentucky team next year, certainly early in the season when their freshmen are still gelling. Uh, doesn't mean it's a gimme win, especially not at Rupp Arena, but it'll be interesting to see how that game shakes out for the Zags. They have Washington at Washington. That's a typical one that we've seen for the last few years as they have renewed that rivalry. This will be on the road for Gonzaga at Alaska Airlines Arena in Seattle. Uh, of course, continuing the annual series, the Zags have won seven in a row and 14 of the last 15 against UW. It's not much of a rivalry at this point, if we're being perfectly honest. There have been a handful of times that UW has played Gonzaga very close in those games. The Rui Hachimura 15-foot game winner stands out to me as one of the more uh, near upsets that Washington pulled against an extremely good Gonzaga roster that year. Uh, and I'm curious what UW is going to look like this year because they've lost a lot of talent in the transfer portal. Noah Williams is out the door. He's still available in the portal. Same with PJ Fuller. Uh, Keon Menefield transferred to Arkansas. Cole Bajema transferred to Utah. That's a lot of depth they've lost primarily in the guard room. However, they add Severe Wheeler from Kentucky, starting point guard for John Calipari last year. Not great. Uh, he's got some issues. He's got, he's very small. He's not a super efficient scorer, but I think could thrive in Mike Hopkins' system. They add Moses Wood from the University of Portland. Zag fans will probably remember Moses Wood. He is very, very talented stretch four uh, who really hurt Gonzaga uh, in the couple of games these last few years. Uh, they also had Anthony Holland, a high-level scorer from the Mountain West out of Fresno State. So I don't think Washington's going to be dramatically better. I, I'm not a big believer in Mike Hopkins as the head coach. If we're being honest, I haven't seen a lot from him that makes me believe this team should really hold on to him for much longer, uh, but they gave him another shot. He added some high level transfers. We will see if he can help turn the ship around. Uh, if not, I think we might be looking at his final year or very close to the end for him at Husky with the Huskies. They also, of course, have the Maui Invitational Field. I'm not going to go through each team uh, and their offseason so far because we don't know who they're going to be playing, but they're going to be playing three of these teams. Shamanad, who is, of course, always in the Maui Invitational. Syracuse in the first year outside of Jim Beheim's tenure. First year, a different person is coaching Syracuse since Gerald Ford was president. Still find that a shocking stat to believe, but it is true. Uh, UCLA, Tennessee, Marquette, Purdue, and Kansas. My goodness. Uh, Isaac and I, my co-host Isaac Shade of the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, we recently did our top tens uh, for next season. Kansas is number one. Purdue, I think we had three and four. Marquette has was in our top ten for all of them. Tennessee was uh, honorable mention. So those four teams are all probably top 15 teams in college basketball next season. That doesn't even count UCLA, who... Their roster has had a lot of turnover, so we will see where they end up getting ranked when the season starts, but I would be pretty surprised if they aren't in the top 25 or at least very close to it. And the Zags are going to play three of those teams. So you have UConn, you have Kentucky, you have USC, you have Washington, and then you have three of those teams. That is what we know on the schedule so far with one other game, Yale. The Zags are playing Yale. I'm excited about this. The first Ivy League team to come to the kennel since 1991. This is also, as of right now, the only known game in the non-conference taking place at the kennel. Obviously, there will be many more. But right now, the Washington game is on the road. The UConn game is at Climate Pledge Arena. The, the USC game is, of course, in Las Vegas. Maui, you guessed it, is in Maui. So the Yale game is the only one so far scheduled at the Kennel. Again, first Ivy League team to visit since 1991. Uh, and this is a very, very good Yale team. 21-9 and nine last season. They only didn't make the NCAA tournament because they lost to Princeton in the Ivy League championship game. They ended up playing in the NIT and lost to Vanderbilt in the first round by 10. They did lose their second leading scorer, EJ Jarvis. He transferred to hang out with Todd Golden at Florida for next season. But this is a, a solid Yale team. And I think a, a fun addition to the schedule, a fun home game. I like when they play like, you know, because you got those gimme games that are usually opponents outside the Ken Palm top 300 or whatever. But lately they've been playing some of those kind of mid-major schools that are actually a little bit better. Kent State was a great example last year of them playing a mid-major team that, that legitimately challenged them and pushed them in a major way. And, and I think Yale's the kind of team that could do that. But now what I want to do is I want to look at who else is going to be added to the schedule. Are they going to add another big game is the big question. And if not, who else could they potentially add to round out the schedule? We're going to discuss all that coming up right after this. All right, segment three here, still Andy Patton, still 
Locked on Zags, still talking Gonzaga Bulldogs men's basketball calendar for the 2023-24 season, the non-conference schedule. We figure USC is about to get added. We have heard reports that that is getting finalized as we speak. We knew about Kentucky. We knew about UConn. We knew about Maui. We knew about Washington and Yale. But what do we not know? And the first question, the big question, are the Zags done adding marquee opponents? Right now we have USC, UConn, Kentucky, and Maui. So that's three premier non-conference programs. Granted, Kentucky looks like they're going to be down next season, but USC, UConn, Kentucky, three premier programs, and then probably at least three elite, or at least two elite games in Maui, potentially three, depending who their first game is. If they're scheduled to get Chaminade or Syracuse to start it out, it's not necessarily an elite opponent, uh, but either way, they'll get some combination of Marquette and Tennessee and Purdue and Kansas and UCLA and all those fantastic teams that are going to be there. Last year... The Zags, of course, participated in the Phil Knight Invitational, the PK-85. They also had four other marquee opponents on their schedule, Bama, Baylor, Michigan State, and Texas. So last year, they had four premier non-conference opponents as well as an MTE, a multi-team tournament. So right now, Gonzaga has three marquee opponents and a MTE. So I think there's probably room for them to add at least one more high quality opponent, especially with Kentucky being a little bit down. I wouldn't be surprised to see them add one, maybe two marquee opponents to their calendar while filling out the rest of their schedule with mid-major teams or local teams or some of those other kind of games that we typically see Gonzaga play every single year. And for the record, almost every marquee, marquee team plays these kind of games. It's not just Gonzaga that plays those kinds of opponents. So what are some potential options for the Zags? Well, I think that they could bring either Baylor or Michigan State back. I don't think Alabama or Texas are as likely to be their opponent for this year because those were predetermined two-year agreements. A two-year agreement with Alabama to play in Seattle and Birmingham, a two-year agreement with Texas at their respective home arenas. I don't think that they'll add them again. But Baylor's a team that they kind of seem to periodically toss on the calendar to play often at neutral site arenas. And I wouldn't be shocked to see that happen again. Mark Few and Scott Drew have a good relationship. These teams have had good battles in the past. It would not be surprising, especially with Gonzaga to the Big 12 rumors really heating up. If between now and November, Gonzaga is confirmed to go to the Big 12, which I think is possible, I would not be surprised at all to see Gonzaga adding a Big 12 opponent to their schedule. Baylor being a team that makes probably the most sense considering their history, the friendship between the coaches, all of that good stuff. Michigan State, Mark Few and Tom Izzo, also good friends, have also played each other many times. Michigan State is looking like a preseason top five, top 10 caliber team. They return all of their talent from last year's team. They also bring in the a top five recruiting class in the class of 2023, led by Xavier Booker, a big man that is going to be really good for them next year. If it's not Baylor or Michigan State, again, I kind of stick with that Big 12 because I really do think that a Big 12 opponent makes a lot of sense for them to add. Kansas is in the Maui Invitational, so I don't think it will be them. We already talked about Baylor. So that leaves a couple other opponents. Houston is one that really stands out to me. Kelvin Sampson has done an awesome job with that program. They're new to the Big 12 next season. Uh, They're a top 10, top 5 caliber team, even without Jairus Walker, even with Marcus Sasser graduating. That's a really solid up-and-coming program, and I'd love to see Gonzaga get involved with them, especially as those Big 12 rumors pick up. West Virginia, Bob Huggins, of course, uh, a lot of controversy around him right now, but him and Mark Few have played each other a handful of times, and that West Virginia team is very solid, having added Kirk Creesa and Jesse Edwards and Caleb Grill this offseason in the portal. Uh, TCU, a real match with TCU after their NCAA tournament game last year. That could be a lot of fun for this program as well. If they don't want to go with the Big 12 matchup, uh, I love when Gonzaga plays the Big East. Always fun to me. I think the Big East is an incredibly fun basketball conference, especially lately. Again, Marquette is in the Maui Invitational. I don't think it will be them. Would they play Creighton? Would they play Creighton after Ryan Empard transfers from Creighton to Gonzaga? My guess is no. My guess is Creighton is not going to want to do that matchup. I I don't blame them. I also don't know if Ryan Empard would want to do that matchup. So they probably won't do that one, although I love when those two teams get a chance to play each other. Xavier and Sean Miller, really fun. 
that would be a really fun game. Xavier lost a lot of talent from their roster last year, but I think they're still going to be very solid. They've made some solid additions in the portal. And I think Mark Few, Sean Miller games have always been a blast. And that would be a fun one to continue to see them con- to, to play. Uh, heck, let's play Let's play Rick Pitino. Let's play St. John's at the freaking Garden. How fun would that be if the Zags got to play at Madison Square Garden against this, this very, very hard to predict St. John's team? They had 11 players enter the transfer portal. They brought in 10 it has been an obscene offseason for Rick Pitino. They just they've completely overhauled the roster. I have no idea how good this team is going to be. Nobody does, uh, but I think they're going to be better because they were not good last year. Uh, and I think it'd be fun to play Pitino at the Garden in the Big East. Just a, just a fun matchup that could potentially happen there. Blue Bloods are always fun to add to the schedule when you can. Uh, of course, can't, Kentucky's already on the calendar. Kansas is in the Maui Invitational, but let's talk Duke or North Carolina. Why not, right? Let's see if we can throw one of those teams on the calendar. Neutral side, if we have to uh, start a home and home, I would love that. They've done a home and home with North Carolina in the past. Can they do it again? Uh, that would be an absolute blast. Arizona. Is Arizona on the table yet? Can they play that game? Tommy Lloyd, Mark Few, of course, the big rivalry there. I think they're not ready for that yet. My guess is as long as Umar Balo is still there, as long as, you know, Shema Karnowski is a GA, Rem Bakamis was there, Matthew Lang, I believe, graduated. Rem is still there as far as I know. Um, I don't think they'll play that yet. I think the fact that they already have USC and Washington on the calendar, they're probably done with Pac-12 teams. I'm excited for when they eventually add that game. It's going to be a lot of fun, but I don't think it's going to happen this year. All right, rounding out the show, talking about some of the not as fun games that could be added to the calendar. I love looking at these potential mid-major teams that Gonzaga could add again. Kent State was a really fun team to have on the schedule last year. I think Yale is a very fun team to have on the schedule this year. So there's already some excitement kind of around some of those teams that are going to be played. But who else could there be? I think I will continue to advocate for this till the last day that I host Locked on Zag, which is hopefully a long time from now. But I will continue to advocate for Gonzaga playing Seattle U. Bring them to the kennel. Let Seattle U come across the city or across the state, play in the in the uh, Spokane, play in Spokane at the kennel. I think this would be a really fun game. I, I think Seattle U is kind of an up and coming program. They're not there yet. They're not there yet. Don't get me wrong. But if Gonzaga is going to play teams that are in the, you know, 100, late 100s, early 200s in Ken Palm, you know, Seattle U, they, they play teams a lot worse than Seattle U every single year. Seattle U is like a 200-ish team in Ken Palm. They might be better than that. I think that Coach Chris Victor is a very, very good up-and-coming coach, and I think this would be a really fun matchup to see uh, a kind of regional thing develop here. Gonzaga already plays Washington every year. Why not add Seattle U at least periodically to that schedule? Uh, You want to stick with regional ones. There's some obvious candidates. Idaho, Idaho State, Montana, Montana State would be fun teams to see them kind of cycle through playing periodically. Eastern Washington's a bit more interesting. They've played them the last couple of years. I don't know if they will play them again with Steel Venters on the roster or not, but it is something to keep an eye on. Of course, a very regional game that they could play there. And then Washington State, again, they've made it clear they don't want to play Washington State. Uh, I don't think that's going to change this year, but I hope that it changes in the near future because I think that that's a game that should be on the calendar pretty regularly between those two teams. A couple other mid-major teams that I just think would be fun to see Gonzaga play. You see Santa Barbara, the Gauchos. Uh, they're going to be a very, very good team next year. They've added Johan Traore, who was a top 25 recruit who went to Auburn for one season, did not develop at Auburn very well, but now he's at Santa Barbara. They had Zach Clements from Kansas, another top recruit who goes to Santa Barbara. It'll be really interesting to see how that program develops those players and, and what that means for them in the Big West. I think either North Dakota State or San- South Dakota State would be very, very fun. Summit League action for those two. Uh, not particularly great programs, but of course, Grant Nelson just came out of North Dakota State. Baylor Shireman a few years ago came out of S- South Dakota State before going to Creighton. So those two teams can produce some talent, and it's always fun to play teams that have those kinds of players on them. Northern Arizona. Stands out to me as well as a team that I think it'd be very fun to see them play because Gary Bell, former Zag Gary Bell, is an assistant coach with Northern Arizona. Gonzaga has played them in the past and adding them back onto the calendar with Gary on the sideline would be a lot of fun. And then finally, I don't think this is going to happen, but maybe they will get a chance to play Valparaiso, where, of course, Roger Powell, longtime Gonzaga assistant coach, took the head coaching job at Valpo for next season, replaced by R.J. Barsh on Gonzaga's sideline. Again, I don't think Gonzaga goes and plays Valpo in their first year, but I wonder if it's something that could happen, if not this year, at least down the line, while Powell is the head coach there. 
All right, that is going to do it for us today and for this week here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Next week, all about the NBA draft. We got Julian Strother previews, Drew Timmy previews. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of those 2025 players Gonzaga has already reached out to on the recruiting trail. We got a whole bunch of good stuff coming your way to close out the month of June as we get into July and these slower months. Don't worry, Locked On Zags not going anywhere. We're going to be with you five days a week all the way through June and July. Going to be fantastic. Thank you so much for listening. Listening. If it's your first, 10th, 50th, 100th episode, I appreciate every single one of you. Shout out to the everyday listener. Shout out to those of you on YouTube as well. If you want to become an everyday listener, go hit that subscribe button on YouTube and get updates as every single show gets posted. All right. Thank you all for listening. Happy Friday and go Zags.